And so it is, and so it shall always be. Get in the car. Get to the safe zone. Let's go. Time to sit back once again with your favourite drink and listen. You are jumping in 15. Are you ready to die, America? I could barely hear the bulky rusky over the grumbling noise emanating from the rusted AN-22. I asked you a question. As he yelled, I felt his massive hand crank my jaw as he brought it against my face. I stared into his cold eyes and didn't say a word. The past 15 years of service to my country has gotten me immune to pain, immune to his taunts. The only fear I felt was of what I'd have to do once my boots hit the ground. It's truly amazing what the human mind can withstand in the moment of violence. I keep telling myself I have another option. But the killer in me won't pull the trigger. Won't give up that easily. Well, the Russian decided to interrupt my thoughts. I see you choose to ignore. It is, how you say, a okay? You are scrawny, small, weak. I doubt you survive ten minutes. I kept staring. He may not know who I am, what my role was, or is in the war, but I do. Even if I have to kill everyone on the godforsaken island, I will walk away. No quip, no American wit. Very well. I'll make sure to piss on your corpse when they pull it out of the dirt. Still not getting anything from me. He moved on to the younger soldier to my left. This guy had to be no more than 22. Probably got captured during his first deployment. But he was big, looked athletic. Maybe he could prove to be a decent ally in the coming fight. Don't try and get in my head, you commie fuck. The young man spat it out in a thick Brooklyn accent before the Russian officer could even get out a taunt. Yeah, when I'm done here, I'll rip your fucking throat out. Well, before he could finish, the uh, commie fuck removed his grok pistol and used it as a club to open a jagged gash on the side of the young New Yorker's head. Still have anything to say, Jersey Shore? The red piece of shit had a grin on his face nine miles long. How does the Snooky have your tongue? Brooklyn looked up. None of the fire in his eyes had diminished. I'm from New York, you prick. My pizza doesn't taste like a gumbus ball sack. I tried to stifle a laugh, but failed miserably. I could see the hate bubbling up in the Russian's eyes, but before he could retaliate... The intercom started crackling, and a pleasant female voice washed over us. Attention. Today's match will be made up of 25 two-person teams. Please look at your seat number. There will be an index card with your teammate's number. Please go ahead and, in an organized fashion, find your partner for today. After freely wandering around the rickety plane, I found myself staring at the man from Brooklyn, and him staring back. I guess you're my new best friend. He held out his hand. Lieutenant Luca Bandoni, 75th Ranger Regiment. I took his meaty hand in mine and shook lightly. Marek Kistich, I... I trailed off. Did it matter if this man knew what I did? Odds are we both end up face down in the mud, our bodies riddled with holes. I guess it didn't matter anymore. I, um, work for the company. I saw the look of surprise and then confusion on his face. He leaned close and whispered. CIA, huh? I thought the orders were if you guys get captured. You take a little cyanide pill and bam, no info for those red fucks. I put on a sly smile. Nah, sometimes orders are pretty outlandish, and it's easier just to pretend you're an ops admin who got lost heading back to HQ. Luca laughed. Oh, man, so what you do? Steal a few patches and hope for the best? My grin slowly subsided as I recalled my past actions. Oh, some private from Missouri or Michigan or somewhere was tasked with driving me to an FOB ten clicks west of the Eastern Front when our truck came under attack. He was killed immediately, took a 762 through the skull. 
I was able to take control of the truck and get some distance before it died on me. I switched clothes with the kid. Thank God rigor mortis hadn't set in yet. Bandoni looked at me with a bit of compassion and said, well, We gotta do shit to survive. Glad to know you're willing to do what it takes. <laughs> willing to do what it takes. Yeah, I can't tell you how many deaths I'm responsible for. I can't tell you how many men, women and children I have killed in the name of American imperialism. But I can tell you, no matter how impossible the situation, I always end up with a pulse. Well, and a few bad memories. Before I could delve further into my pain thoughts, a short skinny redhead with a face full of freckles and acne scars waved me over. Hey, look guys. We're not even combat trained. Like, we, we both fired our weapons at basic. Yeah, I didn't even know how to use a parachute. I looked at who he was referring to as we. Next to him was a rather hefty fellow, sweating bullets and barely able to keep himself from crying. Oh, what the fuck do you two bullet sponges want from us? Luca asked rather menacingly. In the end, no more than two people are making it out of here. You want us to keep you alive long enough so you opportunistic cowards can shoot us in our backs? He was right, of course. The only people we need to look out for were each other. The kid looked at us and, in an even more pathetic voice, pleaded. Please, just switch up with us. We may have to kill each other, but at least if we trade partners, Cappy and I will have a chance of seeing home again. I saw the pain in his eyes. The begging, while his fat partner, Cappy, just stared at the floor. They were already dead. I looked at Luca, and he shook his head once. Well, fuck you then, the kid spat out. If I see you down there, I won't hesitate. Good. If you want to see home again, you shouldn't. As I said this, the kid sat back in his seat looking dejected, despite his emotional outburst. I don't think there's a part of me left that would help the kid, and it looked like Luca had his motivation to stick with someone a bit more resilient than a ginger twig and a weeping fat body. I wish I could look around and still see these men and women as my allies, but all they are is fodder getting in the way of my possible freedom. As I found myself lost in the dark vacuum that is my mind, I noticed something I couldn't pass up. I turned to Luca and whispered, So... The scumbag who smacked us around. Notice where he's standing? As I said this, I subtly nodded my head in the direction towards the back of the plane, where we'd be jumping out. I saw a smile, almost evil, creep onto Luca's face. You're thinking we take him with us? Well, in a way. He has a chute, but he also has a combat knife in his boot. Maybe I distract him, you gut him, or vice versa. Luca's smile turned into a devilish snarl. Oh, gut. I nodded once and sat back in my seat, waiting for our turn to jump. There was no doubt in my mind that Luca, with the hate behind his eyes and his muscular frame, could handle disemboweling the oblivious Russian. It's only moments before I make my jump, 10,000 feet to the ground, but as is my tradition before risking my life, I let my mind ponder on my past experiences. I remembered when someone, maybe an instructor at the farm, or a fellow agent, once told me the best way to survive is to think of home. Remember what it is you're fighting for. It's a difficult task when all you have is a slew of ex-wives, parents who disowned you, and siblings who look at you like a stranger. Now, the only reason I survive is truly because I know no other way. I don't think I fear death anymore. Maybe because it eludes me in times of certainty or because I simply do not crave life any longer. The funny thing is, I never planned on this life. I just got the offer after I finished my studies at Columbia. A man in a nondescript black SUV asked if I wanted to uh, serve my country. Being the only conservative patriot in my graduating class, I took the man up on his offer. Well, look where that landed me, in a rickety old plane about to land on an island and forced to kill my own countrymen. Okay, you rats. Are you ready to shed some blood? The Russian asked, sporting an air of arrogance mixed with excitement. Line up. Two lines, next to your partners. 
Luca and I got up slowly. No rush to be closer to men we would have to kill. The Russian grabbed hold of a piece of rope jutting out of the wall, while the bay door slowly creaked open. I could feel the wind rushing past my face, and barely heard my own thoughts. I turned towards Luca. I saw a look of pure determination on his face. He was ready to kill. We inched closer to the edge, watching as our soon-to-be enemies made the plunge. The Russian, mad with glee, was laughing maniacally as each duo jumped. We were two groups from the front. The skinny redhead and Cappy were about to go over. I could feel the fear resonating off of them. The redhead closed his eyes and leapt. Cappy just stood there, now openly weeping. Please, please no. I have a family, but we have money. Please, anything. He cried out, but the Russian smiled a toothy smile. I count to three, and you jump, or I put bullet in your brain. Cappy started shaking, I saw, as he lurched forward, vomiting the contents of his stomach all over the boots of the Russian officer. In a flash, the Russian smile soured, and he removed his pistol from its holster. The following boom was thunderous, resonating through the thin metal cab of the AN-20. The bullet entered Cappy's skull, spraying the line with blood and bits of flesh. Cappy's lifeless body collapsed to the floor and the Russian unceremoniously kicked it out into the open air. Next, he said, as if he hadn't just executed a man in cold blood. The two in front of us had to grab hold of the walls to not slip in what was left of Cappy's brain on the floor. They made their jump, and we heard our call. Look who it is, my favorite... I didn't let him finish. I put all my weight into a headbutt aimed directly at his nose. I felt as the bone cracked and a geezer of hot, coppery blood erupted on my face. Before the son of a bitch had a chance to register what had happened, he felt his own knife punch his soft stomach. Luca twisted the steely blade and yanked it sideways, spilling the Russian's hot innards on the floor. I grabbed hold of his pistol and yanked it out of the holster. I knew Luca and I wouldn't stand a chance of surviving the three guards rushing towards us with fully auto AKs but I felt starting with a weapon may give us an advantage. Let's go. Uh, Let's go. We don't want those Ruskies knowing who we are. Luca yelled as he made his dive out of the plane. I took one look back at the Russian. He was currently trying to put his intestines back inside himself, flipped in the bird, and made the jump. I remember the first time I jumped, the wind rushing into my face. The euphoric feeling of enlightenment as I soared through the heavens and the thrill that one mistake could lead to certain death. But today was not jump training at Fort Benning, nor was it the jump with my ex on our third date. It was a jump into a life or death fight. As I was free falling, I angled my way towards Luca, and when I was within distance, I gave him a solid tap and pointed in a direction. My plan was simple push out as far as we could and keep distance from the other participants. Luca acknowledged my plan with a thumbs up and we continued our descent. Once we were low enough, we ripped our chutes cords, feeling the slight pull on our harnesses. Hey, Luca shouted and waved towards a group of warehouses. I turned in my harness and saw multiple groups pulling their cords and floating in different directions, hoping they didn't land where we were going. I started scanning the ground, looking for places Luca and I could scour for weapons, food, and the gear we would need for the coming days. Eventually, I saw a warehouse at least 100 meters from our initial planned drop point, and I started aiming my chute steadily towards it, with Luca following close behind. I felt my knees buckle slightly as I made my running landing. I quickly removed the chute and watched as Luca landed roughly 20 yards ahead of me. We both sprinted into the warehouse and started scavenging. Oh, shit, son, Luca proclaimed. I looked over to see him holding an M16A1. Didn't look like he'd seen you since the Vietnam War. Luca disappeared from view as he bent down to pick up more supplies. I got two, no, three mags of 556. Twenty round mags, though, and this fucking thing is fully auto. After hearing Luca's admonishment of his weapon... I was silently hoping that the other teams were also getting stuck with vintage firearms. 
started getting a bit worried. I wouldn't have anything useful except for the 9mm I currently carried until I spotted the gleam of metal in the corner of the warehouse. I made my way over, careful to take a quick peek outside before noisily looking through the container. As I reached the pried open box, I immediately felt a rush of frustration come over me. The shine of metal I saw was from the hook part of a three-foot crowbar. You find something good? Luca asked. No. Crowbar. I still have the nine I took from our friend back on the plane. I again took a peek out of our current cover and gathered our surroundings. Sparse vegetation, open field with no other buildings around and just large patches of forest dotting the edge. Hey, you check your fanny pack yet? Luca yelled down to me. He was now on the top floor of the warehouse, looking under plastic tarps and poking through half-open crates. It took me a moment to realize what he was talking about until I looked down at the small satchel strapped to my outer thigh. Before boarding the plane, each participant was given the fanny pack, as Luca so eloquently dubbed it. We were given strict instructions, of course under the penalty of death, to not open our packs until we landed. I quickly unzipped the small container and found two electronic devices and a rolled up piece of paper. I put the devices back in for a moment and read the note. Participant, you have been bequeathed with the great honor of entertaining the people of the reborn Soviet Republic. Those who survive are granted full immunity for their crimes against our great nation and sent back to their country of origin. For this match you are blessed with the gift of a partner. Each member of your team has a GPS and a communicator. Just simply speak the serial number of your partner's microphone into your own, and once you do, you will be connected to each other only. The GPS will periodically remove an area of the map. If you are caught in an area that has been removed, you will have a short period of leeway before one of our wardens comes to remove you from the competition. There are no rules, except survival. You read it yet? Luca asked, rather vehemently. You are blessed. Freaking nerve of these commie shits. They threw us on an island and telling us to kill each other. How the fuck are we blessed? What, we get a new bestie to die with? I let out a small chuckle. <laughs> it's just for show. These pieces of garbage just want it to seem like an honor. It's all a game to them. I read aloud my serial number with Luca following suit. Once we were connected, we peeked at our GPS devices. Looks like we're right on the edge of where we need to be. But what the hell's a warden? You think they mean soldiers? I asked, and Luca looked as puzzled as I was. Well, we have weapons, so I doubt they're going to send their guys to get fragged by a bunch of POWs. Who the fuck cares? Let's just avoid them as best we can. I nodded in agreement. Right now, our main concerns needed to be gear. Look about half a click south, Luca pointed to my GPS, now wrapped by its leather band to my wrist. There's a cluster of buildings behind those trees. I studied the map, looking at the space between myself and the next scavenging site. Nothing to hide behind on the way, but we landed pretty far from anyone else. I think if you make cover, I can make a run for it. Luca looked at me and nodded. Few words needed to be spoken. He understood the risks I was willing to take. Luca started climbing to the top of the warehouse, wanting to make sure he had a visual on me and the space I'd be running through. Okay, I heard Luca's gruff voice on the mic. This is the best I can do for now. Just get to the houses and keep me posted. Heard. I started running at a full sprint, hoping I didn't catch the attention of one of the other competitors. Well, I was roughly 50 yards from the buildings we saw and started to think my little run wasn't all that dangerous when Luca crackled over the mic. Marek, you got a team inbound from the left. Uh, one has a rifle and the other a machete, I think. Once you get to the houses, you maybe got two or three minutes before they're on you. Well, I'm tough, but I win fights based on my intelligence not my strength or combat prowess. If two armed men were closing the gap on me, I needed to set a trap and quick. 
He said, rifle on one of those guys. But the other, no gun of any sort? I asked into the mic, hoping Luca hadn't lost faith in me. Oh, I didn't see anything, but I could be wrong. I'm 300 yards away, looking down shitty American-made iron sights. If he was wrong, my trap would end up getting me killed and leaving Luca out to dry. As I second-guessed my plan, I made my way around the small tree line and was able to finally catch a glimpse of the building. If I wasn't pumped full of enough adrenaline to run a space shuttle, I would have felt a bit uneasy seeing a bunch of houses sitting abandoned in the middle of an empty island. The home stood in a small cluster, seemingly centered around a broken granite fountain. The house directly in front of me was painted a brownish yellow, with chips of the ugly paint peeling off and exposing cracked aluminum siding. I made my way around it, realizing it would be hard to hide in a place filled with so many holes. I scanned the next three houses quickly and settled on a house opposite of me. It was two stories instead of one, like the other homes, and didn't seem to be as dilapidated. As I finalized my decision, I heard Luca whisper through my mic. They cleared the tree line. He's safe? Yeah, I responded. Going off comms. I'll let you know when it's clear to head my way. Well, I wanted to sound confident. Last thing I needed was my partner losing conviction and leaving me to die. As inaudibly as I could, I hopped through a broken window on the opposite side of the tree line. I took a look at my surroundings and saw the perfect place to lay my trap. The bottom floor had an open layout with a small bathroom in the back corner. I walked in and smiled to myself. To my right was a large shower stall, and when the door opened, it completely blocked the stall from sight. The toilet stood opposite of the shower, and would be the first place any would-be looter would see. Well, I gingerly placed my stolen pistol on the toilet, doing my best not to bang the metal frame on the porcelain. Once the pistol was placed, I took a step into the shower, Ready my crowbar and waited. Oh, it's hard to believe how much my life has changed. How much I've changed. I remember feeling ideologically superior about humanity and their inherent good as I sat in my international morals class at Columbia. The professor, of course, a mega progressive who identified as three different genders, was arrogantly proclaiming the human race no longer deserved to think for itself, that we needed a class of open-minded intellectuals leading it. Oh, I was so heated, but I knew if I opened my mouth, this petty ass would probably fail me. The most ironic part is the past 15 years have led me to agree with this crazy bitch. Well, maybe not outfit our country or world as a geniocracy, but definitely the fact that people are complete shit. Well, only humans could think sending a hundred men to an island to kill each other was a fantastic way to entertain and keep your country passive. But in reality, it wasn't necessarily about the bloodshed for me. It was the fact that humans repeatedly made the same mistakes, generation after generation. If a species can't stop annihilating each other, does it even deserve life? This, uh, this is my justification for killing so many, and for the lives I'll be ending in the coming days. I firmly believe humans do not even deserve anything more anymore, that they are truly a despicable cause to stand for. I know it's odd that my job is to find the truth and protect my nation, but honestly, I only do it because I know nothing else. My internal soliloquy was broken up by the sudden noise of the front door opening and muffled male voices I could barely make out. Gear check, man. Oh, I got an M1911, AK-47 and a machete. You? FN file. No pistol or blade. Fuck. Alright, this is the last house here. I'll check upstairs, you go downstairs. Works for me. I heard the first voice make its way upstairs as the second's footsteps started approaching my hiding spot. I closed my eyes and steadied my breath, anticipating the perfect kill. I watched, almost in a trance, as the door swung open. Oh, hell yeah! 
my target exclaimed as he briskly made his way to the toilet. I picked up the grudge and inspected it. Watching his every move, I slowly lifted myself to a standing position and carefully edged closer to a killing distance. I lifted the crowbar up, positioned it slightly sideways and then swung with every ounce of my strength. The sharp, hooked end landed exactly where I aimed, right into the man's soft neck. As soon as I contacted, I placed my foot on his back and ripped the crowbar backwards as hard as I could, tearing the man's jugular, carotid and vocal cords in one fell swoop. He was dead in an instant, with almost no noise to arouse suspicion. I quickly made my way to the edge of the ward stairs and waited for his partner to arrive. The ultimate goal was to take him down without a shot, risking that no other team would come to the area. Hey, did you find anything? I heard the second man yelling down the stairs. I found a nice pair of boots, a warm jacket and a friggin' Kevlar vest. Well, if I could feel pity anymore, I would. This man is beginning to feel hope and a chance of seeing home again. But alas, it's him or me. That's always been an easy decision. Hey, you hear me? I moved back towards the bathroom, trying not to slip in the pooling blood. These men had just met each other. I doubt the living one would recognize his partner's voice. Oh, yeah, I got a pistol. I yelled up to my faux partner. It felt like an hour until he responded. Oh, okay, nice. Uh, grab what ammo there is and let's get the fuck out of here. Oh, I got a creepy feeling about this place. As he was speaking, I could hear him moving towards the stairs. As quickly as I could, I made my way back to the wall. I listened as each step creaked under the man's weight, trying to quickly surmise how I put this man down without creating havoc. Oh, oh shit, I, I, I forgot one more jacket. If you want it, come and grab it. The man said from about halfway down the stairs. Fuck, this guy was a real team player. Oh, I'm good, I called back. Uh, uh, found a hoodie in the shower. Oh, possibly the worst excuse I could come up with, but it was something. Oh, whatever. Well, Ruskies ain't known to be too privy to the norm, the soon-to-be-dead competitor said. I again heard him start heading down the stairs, taking his sweet time. Once I heard him getting closer to the bottom of the stairs, I swung around hoping to catch him with the crowbar. Twang! The metal crowbar connected with his shin, and I could feel the reverberations up the shaft of my weapon. Fuck! Oh, he yelled. Oh, so much for keeping it quiet. He tumbled down the stairs, landing face first on the bottom step. Before he could react any further, I brought the crowbar down on his head feeling it crack under the crowbar's weight. I brought it down three more times, sending bits of bone and blood to splatter against the wall and my face. Breathing heavily, I turned my mic back on. Both are dead. You're clear to come here. Holy shit, Luca replied. Yeah, you must be the real deal. <laughs> I pegged you for dead. I laughed aloud and retorted. I may not be as young and fit as you, but I make up for it in experience. But I do have some weapons. I'll get up on the tree line and give you cover. I ran back to where my first victim perished and grabbed the FN file. Uh, AKs are great weapons and all, but I needed something with a bit more control. Luckily, the man not only had the rifle, he also had an ACOG scope, and of course he was holding my Grach pistol. I grabbed all I could booked it to the tree line and advised Luca to start trucking it. As Luca started running towards my position, I used my scope to spy on the open expanse, looking for any sign of movement, when something caught my eye. Roughly two football fields to Luca's left, I saw a light refracting off something on the ground. It took me a second, but I realized I was looking towards another sniper. I took a breath, pulled the trigger twice. The loud bangs sounded like thunderclaps on the abandoned silent island. As my weapon settled back down to focus on where the sniper lay, I saw that the gleam was gone. 
I was positive the shots didn't connect, but it sure as hell scared the man away. What the fuck was that? Luca yelled as he got to my position. What are you trying to fucking cap me, man? I gave him an annoyed look, but calmly sat. Sniper was looking this way. Scared him off. I saw Luca's face redden and take an apologetic look. Sorry, brother. Nerves are on edge. I nodded slightly and signaled for him to follow me. I led him over to the two-story house where I'd just ended two men's lives. Luca took one look at the carnage and said softly, Jesus, I spoke to these guys on the ground. Both of them Marines. They had wives and kids at home. Well, I hope one day a sentence like that could fill me with guilt. But today was not the day. Hey, they are dead so we can live. Get geared up and let's move out. Luca looked up at me. It seemed that the gravity of what we must do to survive had finally dawned on him. He swallowed deeply, closed his eyes, and almost whispered. Man, how the fuck could you kill them so easily? I mean, these guys were on the same side. Oh, just, oh, just ignore me. I looked at him, and he knew I couldn't ignore this. So in one quick move, I pulled my 9mm out and placed it gently against his head. Luca, to me the choice is simple. If you aren't willing to do what it takes, then you're just dead weight. I put an emphasis on dead, making him think killing him was my goal, even though I planned to do no such thing. The fire in Luca's eyes reignited. Put the gun down, old man, or I'll break your arm and shove it up your ass. I smiled as I lowered my weapon. Oh, I wasn't going to kill you, kid. Just needed to make sure you weren't shell-shocked into submission. Luca took a deep breath and grumbled. All right, you asshole. I'll keep my shit together, but you can pay for my enormous therapy bills when we get out of this. I laughed out loud and pointed towards the recently dead Marine lying at the bottom of the stairs. Okay, I grabbed what I could from this guy in the bathroom. This one's all yours. The kid gave me a disgusted look, but he knows this is my way of making sure he's true to his word. He leaned over and gingerly pulled the rifle off the man's shoulder and grabbed the pile of clothes and Kevlar lying next to the corpse. You need a jacket or anything? Gonna get cold. Yeah, if we're still in the Northern Hemisphere, that is. I looked at him and said, Yeah, there may be another one upstairs. I'll go get it. Lucas seemed to be getting his shit together and nodded once as I made my way up the stairs. As I got upstairs, the stink of new blood was suddenly overtaken by the scent of rot. This island is clearly used frequently, judging by the random bullet holes and the explosion scorched earth. So it was no surprise to me I could smell the leftovers of a few long-dead American soldiers. The upstairs was the opposite of the bottom floor, where the bottom was open and airy. The top seemed to be made up of only bedrooms and thin hallways. The first room I entered held the jacket I was looking for. Unlike the weapons we were finding, the jacket was a newer model and made from waterproof Gore-Tex. I slid it on, enjoying the feeling of wearing something besides a ratty white t-shirt. Ah, oh, feels good wearing something that doesn't smell like piss, eh? I asked into the mic. Yeah, if I make it out, my one request is to have these clothes burned, Luca responded, seemingly back to form. <laughs> if? I asked. Yeah, when? Luca retorted. Uh, if there's anything I've learned, it's a positive attitude that's half the battle. Luca, I'm going to make a quick sweep up here before we move on. Check the GPS and see where we have to go next. Luca grunted in acknowledgement, and I made my way through the rooms. As I got to the last door, a strange feeling of dread washed over me, supposedly the same feeling the Marine had before I killed him. I shook it off and nudged the door open. As I peered inside, the smell of rot became overpowering. There were no bodies, but someone had died in here, and from the aromas infiltrating my nostrils, they died ugly. But I walked in anyway, my curiosity and strong stomach prevailing, and I started taking in the room. 
The old purple carpet was faded and, and clearly had been cleaned repeatedly. The white walls more of the same. The most interesting, albeit most worrisome part, were the three deep drag marks in the wall, as if some massive animal was trimming its claws. Oh, Maluka, I got something weird up here, I said in the mic. Looks like something besides a human killed some folks up here. Huh? I'm coming up, I heard as Luca's big frame clambered up the stairs. Hey, where are you at? I popped out the door and gave him a nod, and he made his way over. What the fuck? Luca asked, confused about my discovery. Looks like a freaking velociraptor came in here. I walked up to the marks and ran my hand through them, truly realizing the size and power of whatever had made them. Well, maybe that's what they mean when they say the Wardens. Maybe they release some sort of attack animal. Luca gave me a condescending look and said sarcastically, Yeah, Boris and his attack bears came out of hiding the minute we're out of the zone. I gave him a dirty look, but decided an argument wasn't the best direction to go. Well, let's just hope we don't run into whoever or whatever did this. Yeah, agreed and sorry. I'm not known to be enjoyable to be around. The only person who's ever liked my sarcasm is my wife. I looked up at him and quickly understood what his motivation was. If I was a fatherly figure, or ever tried to be someone's mentor, I would say something like, Oh, you'll see her again. Instead, all I said was, Okay, let's just keep the personal shit to ourselves, okay? Luca as if already expecting the emotionless response, nodded curtly and started moving down the stairs. You find a place to head to? I asked, trying to distract us from our mild infighting. Luca waved me over to look at his GPS and said, See the whole playable area? It's a circle, and the areas outside the circle are where you get killed or taken or whatever. Well, we're right on the edge and we need to move southeast south. Only issue... It looks like our choices are open fields or areas heavily laden with buildings. The other issue is here. Luca put his finger directly on a large channel that separated us from what looked like the circle we'd be closing in on. Look at the scale. It's about a half mile wide and I doubt we're going to want to swim that. I looked at my GPS, trying to find some route to the island. Two bridges. One in the north, the other in the south. Only issue is they make great choke points, I said. Well, I think I saw vehicles all over the place. And if there are cars, there may be boats. Let's not lose hope yet. Luca nodded in agreement, and we set at a quick pace towards the channel. Stop, I hissed. Luca halted in his tracks and got himself into a prone position. What is it? he whispered. People up ahead? I turned around and nodded. Even though he was a soldier, I volunteered to take point due to the fact our present circumstance wasn't as distracting to me. I low-crawled my way behind a wide Aleppo pine and signalled for Luca to follow suit. I saw two guys, about 50 metres ahead of us, moving in the same direction, about 10-15 yards apart. I think it'd be best to avoid them for now. Just wait until they're further away. No. We take him down now, quick and clean. Less to worry about later, Luca whispered. I wasn't sure if this was strategic planning or his desire to prove himself as a valuable team member, but I decided to humor him. Okay, I said, handing him my rifle. Look down the sights and spot them. Once you do, tell me the game plan and I'm in. Luca took the old rifle and scanned the area in front of us for a few moments, pausing intermittently and taking mental notes. Okay, we kind of got lucky here. Between us and them are a dozen or so more of these trees. If we move fast and quiet and use the trees as cover, we can catch them off guard. Well, his simple plan could work, but the one worry I have was the multiple gunshots. Interesting plan, but how do we not draw anyone... Three rounds ripped into the opposite side of our tree splintering bits of wood outwards and into the ground next to us. Fuck. Looks like they saw us first. 
Luca leaned around the corner and fired a few rounds in the general direction of the incoming fire. Okay, I got eyes. One's flanking left, your side. And I got the providing cover. I'll run right. You lean out and take out the tango and move into flank. Heard? Well, I was taken aback, but was truly reminded that this young man was a ranger and at least had some of his shit together. I added Luca his M16 and took back the FAL. All right, send some rounds downrange and I'll make a break. I whipped around the corner and saw my target immediately get behind a tree. So I inched further outwards and sent some round towards his partner's direction while Luca took off to the right. The fusillade of bullets striking the trees and ripping through leaves sent a surge of adrenaline through my body. The feeling of your life being ended abruptly by a well-aimed shot or an unlucky piece of shrapnel sent careening into your exposed flesh truly awakens the animal inside. Luca made it to cover, and my target popped out and fired one round before going back behind. To me, this means the guy was scared. Luca, I said over the mic. My guy's nothing to worry about. Give me cover and I'll take him out, and then we pincer the last one. Okay, covering. I heard as Luca let loose a burst of fire from his old rifle. I immediately ran, arcing left around my target, hopping tree to tree as Luca distracted his partner. The enemy combatants came out of cover twice, each time not firing. It was only a moment before I was completely to his left, with him unaware. I took aim down my scope, held my breath and pulled the trigger. My fellow POW collapsed immediately, with a large caliber round piercing the side of his head and sending bits of him to the forest floor. Mine's down. What's the status on your guy? I asked into the mic. Guy has me pinned pretty good. Whatever he has is fully auto and I'm down to my last mag. Shit. Okay. Flank further right. I'll pop a few shots in his direction. I lay prone and aimed back down my sight. The man's pine was at least four feet wide, making it impossible for me to get a clean shot. But I had to distract him for a second, so Luca could move. You ready? I asked into the mic. No, there's only cover by a tree directly in front of him. I'll have to move left instead. Well, so much for a pincer attack. All right, I'll try to flank to his left. You go no further than in front. Hopefully, he finds you to be the better target so I can get a shot. But I'm ready. So stop moving. I responded. I switched my rifle to full auto and let off a burst of fire towards the tree. Luca immediately moved to his right, finding cover behind a bullet riddled spruce. Like I expected, the man turned his rifle in my direction, trying to see where the shots had come from. Before I could say anything, Luca sprinted full tilt toward the soldier's tree, the dead marine's sidearm in his hand. At the halfway point between the two warriors' cover, Luca's target made the intelligent decision to engage the enemy he could see, but as he moved to fire, he exposed himself and gave me the opportunity to send rounds careening towards his head, forcing him to lurch forward and in Luca's direct line of fire. Luca raised his M1911 and took aim at the man's head, and to his credit my fellow POW looked Luca right in the eyes and nodded his head once. Luca closed his eyes and pulled the trigger. It always seems that the gunshot that kills a man was the loudest. Well, this one was deafening. I made my way over as the soldier slumped to the ground, while Luca dropped his pistol and sat down against the tree. Get up, I growled. Everyone on the island heard this fight. I bet they'd love to get their hands on our shit. Luca violently punched the ground. Oh, fuck you, old man. Not everyone's perfectly fine with killing their brothers. Luca spat out at me. I walked quickly up to him, yanked him to his feet by the collar. Hey, do you want to see your fucking wife again, huh? I grabbed him and shoved his face in the direction of the man he just killed. Look, goddammit, this is what you have to do to fucking live. This is what it takes to see your family. And if it doesn't seem fair, get over it. Because that's our truth now. That's our fucking reality. I finished my rant by pushing him away and busily looking through the dead man's belongings. As I got my hands on his stare AUG and his roughly six magazines of 556, I heard Luca starting to approach me. Before I could turn, I felt his meaty hands grab me by the neck. 
With little effort, he lifted me up and slammed me face first into the ground. I immediately tasted dirt and blood and saw stars run across my eyes. Without missing a beat, Lucas sent a painful kick to my midsection, and I felt the wind rush out of me. I stayed down momentarily, silently hoping he was done. I then got myself up to my knees, coughing and spluttering as I felt Lucas send a wad of spit on the back of my head. Thinking I was done, Luca turned and went to pick up his drop weapons. I spat out a gob of blood and a bit of tooth while pushing myself off the ground. Oh, you hit like a bitch, I grumbled as I dusted myself off. Luca turned and charged me, his eyes filled with the fire and rage I saw back on the plane. But this time I was ready for his burly frame. As soon as his arms were in reach, I dodged to the right and brought a bright hook across his face. His momentum and my hit sent him careening towards the ground. Before he had a chance to rejoin the fight, I pounced on his back and grabbed him in a chokehold. Are you done? I yelled at him. Fuck you! He choked out, while sending three quick elbows to my already bruised ribcage. I rolled off him, feeling searing hot pain shoot through my midsection. Luca rolled over and grabbed for my throat. With no other option, I sent a hard kick into his genitals, making him double over in pain. We laid there for a short period of time, both of us feeling our injuries. I turned to him and asked, Hey, why hasn't anyone found us and killed us yet? Luca moved to a sitting position, hand still cupping his aching testicles. Probably because they heard you kick people in the nuts. Well, I let out a burst of laughter. I had no choice, man. You were beating the shit out of me. I said, hoping I'd kick the aggression out of him. Lucas stood up and reached his hand out and said, Listen, I'm not good with this, but if I get to see Tessa's face again, it'll make it worth it. But in all reality, you're the only person on this island I'd be okay with killing at this point. Well, I took his hand and smiled. Well, if I had a dollar for every person that I work with who openly wanted to kill me, I'd be a rich man. Luca snorted and said, I believe it, but well, back to your question. I think it's a bit suspect that no one has come to investigate all the gunfire. As I pondered over our unheard of luck, I realized quickly why we were not in another gunfight. Luca, look at your GPS. The map was slowly shrinking, revealing that we had maybe five minutes to get to a safe area, which, by the map scale, was about half a kilometer. Oh, fuck, it's going to take more than five minutes before we get safe, I pointed out. But we still need ammo, and these guys seem loaded, Luca responded. I took a deep breath and said, Okay, so whatever's out there probably won't kill us immediately. I'm thinking we grab what we can and book it. We run fast enough. I doubt we'll get ganged for being a little late. Before I'd even finished, Luca was running towards the man I killed, clearly no longer wanting to face the one he'd ended. I finished packing up the AUG and the five magazines left scattered around the carcass, and saw that he had a backpack. I shimmied it off his shoulders and was lucky enough to find a long-range scope, some medical equipment and a hand grenade. These guys must have landed somewhere a bit more heavily laden with weaponry. I gathered what I had and waved Luca over, thinking he'd stop and at least discuss where we should run to. Instead, he just took off towards the safe area. I rolled my eyes and followed suit. After about five minutes of full sprint, the fear of being stuck out of the safe zones dissipated as the logical fear of other people waiting for stragglers set in. Luca, I crackled through the mic, struggling to talk and breathe correctly at the same time. We're getting close. Maybe running full tilt out in the open isn't such a good idea. Looks like there are houses to our right. We'll be fine. But before he could finish his sentence, automatic gunfire erupted from behind us and shred the ground around our feet. Both of us started zigzagging, hoping the shooter was a terrible aim. I felt as the rounds punched by my head and saw them pound the ground in front of us. Lucas suddenly made a sharp turn to our right dove behind a thick concrete wall that wrapped around the outside of the housing unit. I rapidly made my way to him and lunged over the wall, feeling the rounds puncturing the thick concrete. How far till we reach the zone? I yelled through the incoming gunfire. 
Looks like only a hundred meters or so. Lucas screamed back. Fuck, we were out of time and under some serious fire. I popped out for half a second and immediately a fusillade of bullets erupted in my direction. Ugh, oh, we're pinned. Crawl left, I'll crawl right. And on my signal, we unload. Whoever he aims at, the other runs. Luca nodded his head once and started crawling at a fast pace towards the left end of the wall. One, two, three, I shouted. Simultaneously, we, we popped out of cover and rained fire in the direction of the shooter. When I finally got a good look at our new friend, I realized who it was. The freaking ginger. He was marching towards us in full body armor carrying an M240 Bravo. He was still 150 meters away, but with the large caliber machine gun's effective range being almost 900 yards, that didn't help us much. Without a scope, it still seemed he recognized us and decided he hated me more. He let loose another barrage of rounds, this time directly at me. And as he did, Lucas sprinted the hundred meters we had left till the safe zone. Ginger seemed disinterested in my partner and kept his munitions pointed at me. Okay, hundred meters back there's a ditch, Luca yelled through the mic. I can give you some cover, but my twenty round mags are gone in half a freaking second. I breathed deeply, wishing now I'd just snap that ginger twink's neck back on the plane. Oh, Luca, don't waste your ammo. I'm pinned, but this retard couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. He has to reload soon. Cover your six and I'll take care of the carrot top. I checked my rifle, making sure I had a few rounds left in the magazine. I closed my eyes as shots started ripping through the concrete wall. In a flash, I stood up and let loose a few misplaced rounds in the kid's general direction and started a zigzag run back to the ditch. Oh, you're a freaking nutcase, Kistich. I could barely hear Luca over the sound of the 308 blasting away the earth at my feet and the large caliber round zipping about my head. But in seconds, I made the distance and landed next to Luca with an audible thud. Holy shit, you got any bullets in you? I felt my body and looked for any excess holes, and luckily found none. No, looks like the god of war is still on my side. Luca grinned and stated, So, you gonna kill Babyface or are we here? Luca stopped mid-sentence as the shooting abruptly stopped. Thinking the kid was reloading, I popped up onto the ridge of the ditch and aimed down my recently recovered high-power scope. The kid had just reached the wall and was indeed reloading. I held my breath as I leveled my sights. The FAL wouldn't punch through his armor, but a shot straight to the head may still kill him, just by sheer concussive force alone. But before I could make the fatal shot, something strange started occurring behind the kid and was moving steadily towards us all. The relatively clear day was quickly consumed by deep grey, almost dark clouds. The ginger stopped what he was doing and finally took notice of the strange occurrences happening around him. He removed the heavy helmet adorning his head, leaving it unprotected. The stormy clouds slowly but surely reached the spot on the GPS that marred the edge of the unrestricted area. In moments, only a few feet in front of me was a darkened land, encompassed in the black clouds. As I was observing, Luca popped up next to me, looking himself. The fuck? Luca was looking down at his GPS. Looks like the weather's fine in the area we're supposed to be in, and it's shit out there. Holy shit, it feels like 60 degrees, but I can see the kid's breath. Luca was right. Wisps of air escaping the ginger's lungs could be seen hanging around his open mouth. As if on cue, the kid shuddered violently, as if beset by a chilling wind. What the fuck have the Ruskies cooked up? It's like they made some sort of... Before Luca could finish his sentence, a clap of thunder reverberated through my brain, almost knocking me off my feet. Within a second, a powerful bolt of lightning struck the ground near the ginger, sending him careening backwards, away from the wall. I thought that was it, and after seeing what rose from the smoldering, smoking ground, I wish the lightning is what the Reds had created to finish us. But no, it was something much, much worse. The ginger got up and dusted himself off, but he seemed to be completely ignorant of what was unfolding behind him. The smoke started clearing, 
before, where I only saw an open expanse of land, I caught my first glimpse of a warden. The man, beast rather, stood at least eight feet tall, his body adorned in thick black robes. I couldn't catch a glimpse of its front, but I could tell its face was covered by a hood or shawl. It made its way toward the unaware combatant, and as it did so, the beast's arms extended outwards, revealing thick metal claws roughly two feet long. The zing of the metal scraping along the ground caused the kid to finally turn around. Well, his face said it all. Even from my distance I could tell he was frozen in place, the dread coursing through his body. The towering monster stood over him, and in a flash all six of the beast's blades were thrust inside the skinny ginger. Almost nonchalantly, the monster ripped his massive appendages sideways, tearing the kid to shreds. Holy fuck, Luca yelled as chunks of flesh and blood rained down over the monster. Gistich, please tell me you got some intel on that thing. I just shook my head as I leveled my rifle towards the monster, unsure if it would even do anything. I pulled the trigger twice, watching as the rounds punched into the monster's back. Nothing. Just some dust from its shawl puffed out, but no pained reaction or collapsing in a pile of blood. Really? The fucking thing just appeared out of thin air and you decided to shoot it? Is kill your only setting? I gave Luca a dirty look and went back to watching the monster. But in the half second I turned away, it was gone. I used my scope to scan the tree line and the hills beyond where the monster had last appeared, but... It seemed it had left without a trace. I moved closer to the edge of the unrestricted area, hoping I'd find a better angle. I took aim again, looking through the scope with my right eye and keeping the left open. Suddenly, I was hit with the overwhelming stench of a perforated colon left in the sun for a few days. I closed my eyes, hoping to high heaven that the beast wasn't near. I slowly opened them, and the only thing I saw was black. The beast towered over me as my whole body tensed. Fear rippled through my soul, leaving me locked in place. The head of the beast was covered in a black hood, which in turn shrouded its face in a blanket of darkness. But even though I could feel its desire to tear into me with its claws, it just stood there, staring. Kistich, I can't go past the boundary, I heard Luca yelling to me, but I couldn't move. Years of war and death couldn't train someone for the fear you feel when a demon stares into your eyes. Well, logic told me it wasn't a threat, but the shit dripping down my pants leg did. Without reason, I started walking towards the monster, getting ever closer to its razor-sharp blades. My whole world was slowly turning black. The beast was in my head, and I was in his. And I could feel his millennia of torment as he sucked me into his eternal embrace. I knew this must be the end, as my foot crossed the boundary into the darkness. Soldiers always talk of killing as a difficult task, how they remember the face of every life they take. I don't. All I remember is the first. My memory resides on that face not because of guilt or an internal memoir of my loss of innocence, but because it woke something in me. No, not some internal sociopathic demon, not some subconscious bloodlust, just a sign that life didn't mean much. I was lying on top of a building, looking down at a man who was sitting at a corner booth in a quaint Belgrade cafe, admiring the architecture of the Kristich brother as he sipped thick, syrupy Turkish coffee. I sent a 338 Lapur into his skull, spraying blood and brains across his meal of burek and papara. It's hard to imagine the situation, especially if someone spends their life wrapped in the confines of suburbia like I did. But when I pulled that trigger, and the 65-year-old bomb maker slumped dead in his chair, scalding his chest with his morning coffee, I knew right then and there, life was meaningless. But not much mattered. I tried to feel guilty. I tried to be human. Nothing came of it. From that day forward, I was the go-to guy for the company to remove targets deemed too dangerous to live, but not important enough to be captured. It's nothing like the movies, though. 
No crazy shootouts. No fancy dinner parties where I spiked a target's drink with cyanide. Just a loud bang and I went home. Granted, if I was doing surveillance, it was just a cheap takeout. A pack of parliaments and a bunch of expensive recording equipment, courtesy of the American taxpayer. Yeah, nothing too grand. Just a simple life of ending lives. Hey, wake up, fuckhead. I felt a hard slap to my already bruised jaw as my eyes fluttered open, taking in Luca's massive frame as he hovered over me. You've been out for ten minutes. We only have thirty left to make it across the channel. Are you with me, or should I leave you behind for our hooded friend back there? I sat up, too quickly, dazed and trying to piece together what had happened. Reading my mind, Luca answered my question. Before you got your chance to suck off the demon, I pulled you back and dragged your ass here. I wasn't sure what he meant by, well, here, until I looked around and realized we were in a run-down old basilica, rife with some cracked stone columns and a crumbling timber roof, barely holding on to broken kingpost trusses. Yeah, I guess I owe you one, kid. I grumbled as I got to my feet, still shaky from my experience with the warden, but steady enough to move. Luca grunted, knowing he probably would get the favor returned in full now that we both knew what we were truly up against. Yeah, well, I'm not sure what the fuck happened. One second it was just standing over what was left of the ginger, and the next, a couple of feet away, and you, you just fucking dropped your weapon and tried to hug the damn thing or something. What the hell was that? I glanced up at Luca while putting a fresh mag in my rifle, and quietly said, I'm not too sure. It was like a gravitational pull sucking me in. I tried to stop, but nothing gave. Again, thanks. Luca grinned this time. That's all right, my old man. Sometimes we get a little disoriented. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, I eat me. I responded, hinting my own smile. But in all seriousness, let's get the fuck out of here. Agreed. Like I said, we got 20 minutes left and about a kilometer till we get to the channel. Once there, it's a long way across, but we should be fine. I nodded and started my way out of the worn church. Looking at the GPS, I considered us lucky. Between us and the channel was a vast expanse of woods, giving us ample cover in case we ran into another team. The wardens may be the true enemy here, but well, that won't stop other groups from trying to gank us. We were making a good pace. Luca was leading, keeping alert and looking out for potential ambushes, while I took the rear guard, just in case any stragglers came from behind. Suddenly, Luca held up a bald fist and pointed to his ears. I stopped moving and listened closely. Uh, uh. Something or someone moaned ahead of us, sounding like a dying animal. Luca started creeping slowly, with me just behind. As we approached an overgrown sessile oak, we saw a bloody hand jutting ever so slightly to the side of the tree. Luca raised his rifle, but I gently put my hand on it. Whoever was behind the tree was clearly no longer a threat to us. Still, I approached cautiously. The man may be dying, but he could have a sidearm at the ready. I circled around the tree and took in a pathetic sight. The man, well, what was left of him, was using his left hand to put pressure on a sucking chest wound while his partially severed right arm hung loosely to the side. He lifted his blooded and bruised face and squinted through the few sun's rays that peeked through the canopied forest. Billy, is that you, Billy? He moaned. Daddy's not coming home, Billy. I'm sorry, but always know I love you. Jesus Christ. Lucas said as he came around the corner. Who or what the fuck did this to him? I looked at the man's barely connected arm. The point where it was amputated was cut almost perfectly clean, almost machine-like. I couldn't inspect his chest wound. The man's broken state of mind rendered his hand immovable. The culprit behind this murder left the guy in a state of deep shock. Best move would be to put him out of his misery. I removed the Russian's pistol from the straps connected to my hip pack and pulled the slide back to make sure there was a round in the chamber. I looked over at Luca. He nodded. No protest for a mercy kill. Oh, so big. 
The man moaned as I pressed the cold steel against his mangled forehead. Thought it was... Uh... The man paused to spit out a gob of foamy, bloody phlegm. A boar, but his tusks, so sharp, tore green down the middle. Ripped me up pretty good, but I made it. I made it to the safe zone, just for some... Another sickly cough and more bloodied phlegm. Some pussy marine to pop me in the chest. God damn it. This freaking guy gets torn up, runs almost a kilometer to get safe, and then gets shot by some opportunistic shitbag. And the guy who just shot him left him here to bleed out. Fucking bullshit, man. Luca spat out. With the pistol still pressed against the man's head, I turned and looked up at Luca. I'm more worried about what did this to him. First the monster who almost got us, and now whatever did this. I responded as I nodded toward the dying man. With strength returning to his eyes, the man looked up to me and said three words. Do it, asshole. I nodded, and then felt the reverberations of the poorly made weapon shoot through my arm as the man's head rocked back into the tree with an audible splat. He fell sideways, finally dead. Wherever Billy was, his dad was tough as nails. Marek, give it to me straight. Do you or any folks at the company have any intel on this shit? I mean, this is big. If the Ruskies are cooking up homicidal masters, I feel the American government spy should have at least freaking have a clue. I understood his anger and his frustration and responded as calmly as possible. Oh man, I don't know. Shit is compartmentalized. People in the CIA could have known. People in the DIA could have known. Doesn't mean I'd be privy to it. I'm SAD, Luca. Wet work. I don't normally fuck around with top-level shit. My team, well, we just kill people. Most of the time we didn't even know if they were a terrorist or a freaking soccer mum. We've seen too much, you know. It's almost hard to be completely honest with someone. My own parents and siblings had no idea what I did. Hell... No one outside of my unit knew what I did. But it is the truth. I'm just a cog in the great American espionage wheel. Fuck. How do we stop these things? Luca was starting to lose control. That ferociousness I respected on the plane now started to become a liability. Look, I don't think we can. You saw what happened when I shot it. I think our only goal now is a... Before I could finish my sentence... Both mine and Luca's GPSs started to vibrate. I looked down and a notification ribbon crossed the screen. Only ten contenders remain. Oh, are you fucking kidding me? There were fifty guys on that plane, Luca exclaimed. He shook his head in disgust as another ribbon crossed the screen. Twenty-two removed by fellow competitors. Eighteen removed by the wardens. Jesus. I got some part of me hope no one else would get killed in one of those things, man. Eighteen? God, those frickin' Ruskies are gonna pay for this shit. I decided snapping at Luca to calm him the fuck down was not the best way to get him focused and get that rage under control. So I turned to him as tranquilly as possible and said, Luca, if we want our revenge, we have to survive. The only option is winning this fucked up game. Getting back to the front lines and beating the Reds. We can do this. We've already proven we are some of the toughest motherfuckers on this island. We're not going to let the commies pests distract us from our one and only goal. Survival. Luca looked at me. I could tell my words had had an effect. <laughs> Didn't think you could say something so, well, not dickish and actually motivating, but again, you're right. You may not be touchy-feely, but... We wouldn't have made it this far without your semi-stable mentality. I gave Luca a surprise look. I was sure this kid was going to frag me by the end of our journey. <sighs> Thanks, kid. Well, we'll get out of here, but seriously, we have to fucking move. Luca grinned and said, Yes, boss. Anything for you. I cracked a smile and started my jog towards the channel, feeling relieved that my partner was calm again. All right, so... I don't see anyone on the opposite shoreline, but what I do see is a boat. Now, driving something with a loud engine would probably draw some fire, 
or give some dickheads the chance to ambush us. On the other hand, we can avoid swimming in 40 degree water and possibly fucking up the bulk of our gear. What do you think, Luca? I asked as we lay prone, staring across the wide channel. Luca motioned that he wanted to take a look. I handed him my rifle and he started his own scan. Yep, I'm down for the boat. We can handle ourselves in a firefight if we're warm and have rifles, but not cold and defenseless. Hmm. Sound logic, so know how to drive a boat? Luca gave me a puzzled look. I was assuming you did. I grinned and stated, slightly arrogantly, Yeah, of course I do. It's pretty fucking easy. Luca gave me a dirty look. Asshole. I laughed and motioned towards the boat. We are about a hundred meters away, in a thicket of bushes on top of a grassy knoll. While keeping a close watch on the boat, I wasn't paying attention to the rocky ground beneath our feet. Suddenly I stumbled over a small pile of lime and immediately tumbled down the slope. As I was spinning and rolling, I felt sharp lime slice up my barely protected arms and legs. When I finally smashed into the rocky beachhead below, I looked around and saw I'd landed at the mouth of a small alcove, a few feet from the boulder. Good cover if we needed it. I could feel a plethora of cuts and bruises forming on my aging body. I'm calm as a bitch, ain't it? Luca yelled down to me. I could feel his smirk all the way down here. Luckily, I received no serious injury, just a few more scars to add to the collection. Yeah, I'm fine, by the way, you insolent little prick, I said to Luca as he gingerly made his way to me. Oh, insolent little prick, huh? I'm sorry, Dad, did I hurt your feelings? I brushed myself off and gave Luca the finger. No, but I do have some limestone in my ass. You want to pull it out? I said with a smile. Luca put his hand up, gesturing he wasn't interested in removing anything from my rear end. Oh, who knew? You can actually be fun, Luca exclaimed. Good. He's in good spirits, meaning he accepted our role finally, or he's deflecting with humor. Either way, it makes our job easier. Yeah, on rare occasions, I said with a slight grin. I bent over to pick up my rifle, when, out of nowhere... I felt a sharp push to my already bleeding behind. I landed with a thud, feeling more rock shred up my forearms and knees. What the f- I felt a hand clasp over my mouth as I tried to speak, muffling me instantly. The hand slipped off my mouth and I turned to see Luca pointing toward the massive boulder at the edge of the alcove. He slid behind it and I followed suit. What's going on? I asked, with a bit of disdain in my voice. Luca just pointed to the boat. I looked through a small space between the base of the hill and the boulder and saw that, as we were fucking around, another group was closing in on the boat from further down the beach. Well, I'm assuming they didn't see us because they weren't shooting. Good call. Want me to take them down? I asked as I gestured towards my rifle. Uh-uh. You'll take out one, but you know, they may be smart and take cover. Let's just wait until we have both clear shots. Kid's smarter than I give him credit for. I kept watch as Luca checked his weapons and got them at the ready. The two men were closing into the boat and I took aim as Luca swung around the corner. You got left, I got right. On my count, three, two... Semi and automatic gunfire erupted from the hill Luca and I had recently vacated. Rounds started pinging the boat, and the two men we were watching quickly took cover. Shit, Luca said. Now we're stuck in the middle of a gunfight. Yeah, but neither side knows we're here. Let's just stay hidden, and whoever wins, let's take them out. Understood? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I laid prone again, making sure I didn't poke out of cover. Luckily, the slight shade from the hill mixed with the darkening sky made us almost invisible to the warring parties. I motioned to Luca to focus upwards, and I'd watch the ground team. At this point, we needed the boat. I took a quick glance at the GPS and saw that the area we were in was not going to be in play. Judging by how much the circle shrunk each time, we'd need to be halfway across the channel before we'd be safe. 
I gestured toward the GPS, and Luca understood. We didn't have much time to stay passive in this skirmish. Well, this wasn't the first time I spent being the third party in a desperate battle. It probably won't be the last. The two soldiers on the hill were green as hell, or barely ever fired a weapon. They had the higher ground and the surprise, yet this was turning into a prolonged fight. If I have learned anything, advantages in gunfights don't last long. Almost on cue, one man on the ground team provided covering fire for his partner as he flanked left. The runner made it onto an outcropping of boulders, giving his team two fields of fire to rain on the higher up enemies. The hill team seemed flummoxed and sprayed bullets in unison, forcing the whole team to need to reload at the same time. The lack of intelligent decision making gave the group on the ground the chance to move. The trained soldier who stayed behind the boat now ran to the right side of the hill and dove behind a small hillock, propping his weapon on the top. As if reading each other's minds, the two marksmen started their attack, catching the team on the hill in a crossfire. I heard a scream and looked back to see one member of the hill team roll down to the bottom, right into our small cover. The man lay there, holding his gut, and loudly screaming in pain. He didn't seem to notice us, staying focused on his mortal wound. Luca looked at me as if to ask what we should do. My response was to shrug my shoulders. If we kill him and his screaming abruptly stops, the winners of this fight would find us. If we let him live, the winners would want to come and finish him. It was a no-win situation. Oh, please, please help. It hurts so bad. Oh, the dying man had finally noticed us, reaching his hand out towards Luca. Luca looked down at me and took the man's hand. Man... We want to help you, but we'd fuck ourselves royally if we got the attention down here. But we'll stay with you and make you last longer than the guys who did this. It's the best we can offer. With tears staining his cheeks, the man grimaced and nodded, fully accepting his fate. In rare form, I scooched over and put my hand on his shoulder. I'm not sure why I did it, it just felt like the right move. Lucas seemed as perplexed as me, but seemed happy with my decision to show some humanity. We heard a few more rounds go off and heard another man cry out. Looks like the ground team won and it was finally time to join the fight. For a few tense moments, we didn't hear anything until... Let's go find where the first one dropped. I'm running low on 762 and I think he had an AK. Roger that. Damn, they set us up with some real bitches this time. You think anybody left even knows how to shoot? The other one said with a laugh. <laughs> I was surprised these idiots knew which end the bullets came out of. The first man retorted, failing to stifle a chuckle. Oh, shit, looks like we got about two minutes to get in the frickin' boat. Wardens are closing in. Luca turned to look at me and whispered. What the fuck? These guys have done this before? What the hell are they, ringers? I shrugged my shoulders but it seems the Russians didn't want any POWs to make it home, so they sent out a bunch of American traders to make sure not a single true allied soldier made it off the island. But frankly, I didn't give a shit. These pieces of trash were going to pay. Luca? I whispered as I picked up the fallen soldier's AK-47. I'm going to put this in front of our cover. Get closer to the base of the hill and try to stay out of sight. I quietly placed the weapon and sprinted full tilt to the opposite side of the hill to the one the traitors were walking down. I slowly made my way back up the rocky incline and watched as the two men closed in on the weapon. I found myself laying prone again, almost in the same spot as before. This time, though, I could take both in quick succession. Ah, looks like I was right. This asshole has an AK. Guessing his corpse dropped back here. The enemy soldier started making his way around the cover. Within a moment, he would find Luca and our dying friend. I chose to aim for his waiting partner and level my sights on his chest. At this range, my rifle would puncture most vests and, if not, it would still knock the piece of shit out. I whispered into the comms to make Luca away. Luca, you got a bogey coming to you. Looks like he doesn't even have his weapon. Before I could finish my sentence, I heard the familiar sound of an M16 
and saw as my AK-toting enemy flew backwards, with fresh wounds opening on his arms, legs, and torso. Almost instantly, his partner turned around, but before he could get the drop on Luca, I sent one bullet careening into his chest. He quarter-turned abruptly from the punch of my high-caliber rifle and collapsed in a heap. I watched as Luca made his way out of the cover, handgun extended. The man he'd shot had turned to his stomach and was crawling to his drop weapon. Luca walked by him and stomped on his outstretched hand, crushing whatever hope he had left of leaving the island. The man turned to Luca with a bloody smile before Luca sent a kick to his wounded mix section. He moved to put the man down for good, but I crackled over the mic. No, leave him for the wardens. I want to watch him suffer. Luca looked up and gave me an evil grin and a thumbs up. The dying man's cocky smile disappeared quickly as he realized the turn of events. Come on, man. Show some fucking mercy. You know what those fucking things do to people. Luca responded. If you're lucky, maybe you'll bleed out before it gets here. The man looked dejected and attempted to get up. A bullet had torn through his bicep, causing him to collapse as he put pressure on his destroyed arm. He cried out in pain and frustration, realizing that his wounds had completely disabled him. I made my way down the hill and went to check on the man I'd shot, while Luca took anything of value off his dying partner. I edged closer to the fallen soldier, and suddenly he stirred. I rushed over quickly and kicked the man in the face, sending spittle and a few teeth into the sand. Well, he recovered much quicker than someone who took a boot in the head and a round to the chest should have, and attempted to grab his sidearm. I decided no more games, and put two more rounds into his chest from my grok, hearing the distinct thud as the bullets hit his vest. He groaned loudly, and I pounced on him. I sent two punches to his face and turned him over. Luca, I yelled. Grab something to tie him up with. We're going to have us an old-fashioned makeshift CIA black side interrogation. Within a moment, Luca came over with the man's partner's shoelaces and expertly hogtied our new hostage. Our buddy? I asked, regarding the soldier who'd fallen behind our cover. Luca shook his head, giving me all the information that I needed. Luca, holding the hostage, and I made our way into the icy water, feeling the chill rise through our body. Luca carelessly threw the injured man in the back of the boat as I got in the driver's seat. Luca sat down next to me as I turned the key and pushed the throttle forward. As soon as the boat started, the GPS vibrated, signifying that the circle was closing. I revved the engine and propelled us out into the channel. Once we made it to a safe area, I stopped the boat. We were about 200 yards off the coast of the beach, and through my scope I could see the incapacitated traitor struggling to crawl towards the water, leaving a trail of blood in his wake. Like before, the sky behind him started to darken, stopping the dying man in his tracks. I moved my scope up to the hill and saw movement coming over the top of it. Oh, the beast that came over that hill was more monstrous, more grotesque than anything that could be from Earth. The demon was shaped like a spider, but it had the face of a human perched on its hairless thorax. Its eight legs quickly drove itself to the fallen man, and even at this distance I could feel the fear radiating off him. The beast then perched itself on its back legs, exposing a stomach arrayed with gore-stained teeth. It used its front legs to grab the man and shove him into its open stomach closing with an audible snap. I watched as the beast seemed to chew the man to pieces, spitting out parts of bone and clothing as it did so. Oh, Jesus, I said as I watched the hideous beast eat the man alive. Oh, he can't help you now, asshole, I heard the prisoner say. Those things, they don't die, and if you're not careful, you could be the next. Oof! Before he could finish his sentence, Luca gave him a kick to his stomach. Shut up, fuckface. You're in for a real fun surprise. When Mr. S.A.D. here gets to you, you're going to wish you were with the wardens. Luca spat out, his words teeming with hate. Special Activities Division. How the fuck did you end up... <clears throat> Luca stopped the man again, but 
this time with a backhand to the man's already bruised face. Not if you understand what shut up means, Luca said coldly. The beaten man gave Luca a dirty look and nodded curtly, signaling he would comply. Marek, how much time we got? I looked at the GPS and, judging by the past view of the circle's moves, I gave Luca my answer. Hour tops. We should aim to get a foothold on land within 20-25 minutes. It's just enough time for me to get this ship back talking. The man looked up, finally realizing Luca and I weren't the competitors he was used to. I hate to say it, but I relished in the terror I saw pass across his beaten face. I will give you some kind of cliched speech about the easy way or the hard way, but to be honest, we're going to kill you and I most definitely will make it painful. The man looked up at me and said, How about this? I'll tell you whatever you want to hear and you just do me the honor of making it quick. I let out a cold laugh and retorted by shooting him in the knee with my grok. Fucking, oh, God damn it! As he lay there bleeding, I removed the crowbar from my waistband and brought it down on his other knee. Now, fuck, what the fuck do you want to know? I smiled and asked, Who are you? Why are you doing this? He winced as Luca wrapped a belt around his upper thigh, attempting to staunch his bleeding knee. He took a breath and said, Me and Gralens, the guy you let get eaten back there, we got captured a few years back. The Ruskies gave us a choice. Be their ringers in this competition, or get a bullet in the brain. We made the only choice we had, and judging by your Machiavellian attitude, the man gestured towards his knees. You would have done the same. Me? My name's Staff Sergeant Rickles, Marine Raiders. Frucking yard. Should have guessed by your handiwork. Hey, we also ran into a guy after getting mauled by a warden. He made it all the way to the circle. He still ended up getting shot and bleeding out in the forest. You have anything to do with that? I asked. Growlins. Yeah, he hit the guy once and his gun jammed. So we just said fuck it and kept moving. In a flash, Lucas sent a right hook into the man's face. Guy had a freaking kid, you selfish piece of shit. Luca yelled. I moved quickly and pulled Luca back. I still had some questions. Well, I'm glad we established you're an asshole, but I have another question. Before I could ask, the man interrupted. Don't bother. We don't fucking know. They never told us what they are or where they come from. They're just, if we do our job right, we'll never have to deal with the wardens ourselves. I looked at the man. He had no reason to lie. No reason to protect his captives. Okay, then. Why do you seem surprised that I was SAD? Because <laughs> they only bring non-combatants to the island. Occasionally an infantryman or a ranger, but never SF or CIA. They want you all to lose to us or the other ringer teams. Before you ask why, probably because they don't want anyone actually making it off the island. <laughs> Thought as much. But still going to win just in case. Oh, Last one. Is anyone watching? Is the purpose of this island something else entirely? The man paused for a second, wincing again at the sight of his shattered knees. Then he took a deep breath and said, I don't know for sure, but I think so. I believe there's this testing facility or something. I'm not sure what for, but I doubt the Russian people are out there celebrating a bunch of POWs getting slaughtered every month. I considered the man's words silently, pondering over the revelation he'd shared. I stood up and said, Thanks. He cleared up a lot of stuff for us. My prisoner nodded once, and I calmly shot him in the head. Before slumping over, I saw a look of surprise on his face, and then he was no more. I gently picked up his corpse and threw it off the side of the boat. Well, that was sudden, huh? Luca asked. I gave him a puzzled look and said, well, I had no more questions, so I shot him. I mean, what else was I going to do? Good point. Luca responded. Just, you know, signify you're going to do it next time. I managed a small grin and replied. Fifty-fifty shot, that happens. Sorry, I can be a bit methodical. Yeah, that's the word. I'm getting this boat moving. Hey, I called dibs on his pants. Mine are soaked. I laughed and said, oh, Fine. 
but I get his boots. It took 15 minutes to get our boots on land, and Luca decided he didn't want to freeze again and grounded the boat. Alright, so it looks like we only have about a kilometer of total area left. Luca said while well, looking at his GPS. That means we'll be hard pressed not to run into anyone. I nodded in agreement and checked my gear. I gave Luca the AUG and all its 556, leaving me with just my foul and about 80 rounds of 762. If we played it right, that's all we would need. <laughs> Our GPS started to buzz, and across the screen flashed a familiar banner. Only five contenders remain. Twenty-five removed by fellow competitors. Twenty removed by the Wardens. Fuck me. Looks like we were part of most of the damage, Lucas stated. Yeah, then. There's one team that's half gone due to a Warden, I replied. Okay, we have a choice. Looking at the GPS, I see that this is where the circle will close, and the next one will be, and we can either post up or wait on the fringes. What do you think? Luca pondered for a moment before replying. Man, after seeing those fucking things, I do not want to be close to them again. Let's go post up, getting hidden as best we can, and hope no one else has the same idea. Okay, works for me, I responded. Let's just focus on moving quick and quiet, and we should be fine. Ten four. We started off towards a large cluster of trees, doing our best to stay hidden. We knew our chances of not being discovered were slim, but we were willing to do whatever it took to avoid the wardens. As we closed in on the area I thought would be the final safe zone, we spotted two of the last three competitors. Luca, you see them? I whispered. Yep, got my eyes on them, Luca responded. The two men were barely visible, laying prone on the edge of an open expanse, clearly waiting to ambush anyone that came their way. One of the men seemed to be occasionally watching as Team Six, searching the blanket of forest where Luca and I hid. I laid as quietly as possible on the pine and leaf-filled ground and took aim at the lookout. You gonna take the shots? Luca asked. I thought for a moment and decided it would be better to wait. There's another person out there, and if we shoot, he'll know where we are. No. Let's wait for the other guy to show her and then take them. Luca gave me a thumbs up and lay prone behind me, covering our asses with his bullpup rifle. Merrick, you think the Ruskies will actually let us go if we win this? Luca asked. I breathed deeply. The same question had run across my mind, but I did my best to dismiss it. In the end, does it matter? Right now that looks like our best bet to survive, so may as well win and find out, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I just hope we didn't kill a bunch of brothers for nothing. Yeah, me too. But let's focus on the now, okay? Yep, Luca responded. As we laid there waiting, I kept my scope aimed at the head of the man looking in mine and Luca's direction, and seemingly out of nowhere, a shot rang out, smacking my would-be target in the temple. He slumped over, dead, as his partner attempted to return fire in the direction where he thought the shooter was. The still living soldier dove quickly behind a large tree trunk as a round ripped off a neighboring tree's branch. Well, I guess we didn't have to wait long, Lucas said. I signaled for him to stay put as I set out on a flanking maneuver to catch the hidden shooter off guard. Over the comms, I said, Luca, get a clear shot on that guy that's pinned down. Once you do, let me know. I'm going to find the other shooter. Understood. As I was low crawling towards where I thought the sniper was hiding, I caught a glimpse of movement directly ahead of me. The sniper had decided to flank at the same time I was, and he was set to run right into me. I stopped moving, trying to utilize all my senses to pinpoint exactly where he was. The thick layer of pine needles and tufts of grass covered both of us from the other's line of sight. I closed my eyes and heard rustling from my right. I still couldn't make him out until I realized he was wearing a ghillie suit, full-body camo that made you invisible to the untrained eye. Oh, the son of a bitch was probably one of the ringers, some SF sniper sent here to wipe us all out. Luckily, he still hadn't seen me, 
staying focused on the team he'd already attacked. I posted up on my knee and let off a magazine load into the enemy sniper's direction, hearing the thuds as my shots connected. I heard the man groan once, and I scooted over to find him bleeding out from a large caliber round through his neck. Luca, perfectly following suit, unloaded into the last enemy warrior, killing him instantly with a barrage of lead. Got him. Your guy down? Luca asked into the mic. Yeah, he's down. Holy shit, we actually did it, Luca said, sounding amazed. I started towards the clearing, waving Luca to follow me. Looking at the GPS, the clearing was where the circle would move next. As we got to the center, I sat down, finally able to relax after today's trial. Luca plopped down next to me, putting his hand out and stated, You might not want to hear it, but thanks. I looked at his hand for a moment and took it firmly into mine. Ah, oh, well, I wouldn't be here if it... Well, isn't this sweet? Luca and I snapped our heads up and watched as a platoon of Russian soldiers emerged from the woods, carrying state-of-the-art AKMs and wearing heavy body armor. The speaker, an old weathered warrior, walked in front of his team, an ancient Tokarov strapped to his hip. He started to slow clap and said, Congratulations, gentlemen. You are the first team ever to defeat our planted men. It's too bad, though. If you didn't kill my man on the plane... I'd let you both go, but you shared Russian blood on Russian land, and as far as we would generally give you a summary execution, but I'm feeling nice today. The Russian removed his sidearm and threw it in front of Luca and me. Whoever is left standing can go home. The other, well, he can be a snack for one of my friends. As he finished his sentence, he gestured toward the tree line, and looked and saw many of the wardens lining up as if waiting in line for an all-you-can-eat buffet. I watched as the spider monster licked its stomach mandibles, and as the giant boar, with what seemed like tusks made of steel, sharpened its appendages on an exposed stone. The tall demon in the black robes stood behind them all, silently waiting for the next person to butcher. Other monstrosities, the like of which I wouldn't even have dreamed of, were circling around the clearing, waiting in earnest for the opportunity to tear us to pieces. Uh, if we're going to kill each other, at least tell us then, what are these things? I asked. I didn't want to risk dying without knowing what the hell was happening here. The old Russian smiled, showing a full mouth of crooked stained teeth. I think not. This is, how you say, none of your business. These fine specimens in the Kremlin have a deal, and... One of you dying is part of that deal, so please carry on or we shoot both of you. Before he had a chance, I dove in front of Luca, grabbing the worn pistol as I simultaneously stood up and pointed it at him. Luca's face said it all. Go on, fucking do it. It's who you are, right? It's all you know. Pull the fucking trigger. I smiled at Luca as I turned the gun on myself. I placed the barrel in my mouth tasting the gun oil and steel. Luca's face changed, and he made a move towards me as I pressed the trigger, when out of nowhere I heard, Some folks are born and made to wave the flag, oh, they're red, white, and blue. And when the band plays hell to the chief, oh, they point the cannon at you. Is that credence? Luca asked as I took the gun out of my mouth. Even the beast seemed taken aback by the sudden onslaught of the old anti-war song. The man turned to his men and started screaming orders in Russian. Luca looked at me with the biggest smile I've seen in a long time and pointed over my shoulder. I turned around to see two Black Hawk helicopters, flanked by a squadron of Apache gunships. The Apaches were making short work of the Russians on the ground and doing their best to be out of reach of the monsters flanking the forest. Luca stood there, dumbstruck, too surprised to even understand that he was saved. I watched as the old Russian was trying to find cover, but his time was up. I grabbed him by the collar and yanked him backwards, smiling as he fell on his ass. Luca walked up and sent a kick to his midsection as I clubbed him with his own weapon. We beat him for a few moments before I stopped Luca. 
whoever just saved us, they probably want to keep this asshole alive, you know, to torture. Lucas snarled and said, I hope they let us kill him. I looked at Luca and said, well, hopefully after this, they send us on some R&R. &R. Luca calmed down again and before I knew it, pulled me into a hug. I mildly reciprocated as we felt the rotors of a black hawk above us. The chopper pulled out into the clearing and delicately landed, just feet away from us. We looked over as a group of men exited the chopper, clad in black uniforms and carrying a range of high-end weaponry. The last person to exit had a massive frame. Standing around six foot six tall, with a burly white beard hanging off his face. He made his way to us, and I could see he was chomping on a cigar and spitting pieces off to the side. I immediately recognized the cocky gait and giant frame. Captain Marsdale. The Vietnam War relic had decided to pick us up himself. Granted, no one really knew which department he worked for, or what he did, but... Most SAD guys have run into him once or twice at Langley. Gentlemen, he yelled over the roaring choppers. May I? He asked as he gestured towards the broken man on the ground. He reached into the ancient Russian's pocket and pulled out a small tablet pressing down on a few buttons. Within seconds of the tablet being used, unholy screams erupted from the forest. The beast seemed to automatically turn and run, leaving us without the feeling of impending doom for the first time today. The Vietnam vet removed his sidearm and shot the odd Russian in the back of the head. That's for shooting down my bird outside of Khaesar, you fuck, he grunted out, sending bits of cigar into the dead Russian's open wounds. He turned back to us and yelled over the rotors. Ah, Kistich, I didn't think you had much of a chance, but you did a damn fine job. Marsdale reached out his hand, and I ignored it. What the fuck are you talking about? Marsdale, not a man who's used to insubordination, decided to ignore my lack of respect and said, Ah, you know how you needed to get inoculated before going to a new country. Well, when the company decided to ship you off to Kiev, I made sure one of my men put a tracker in your shots. Well, on top of that... We had our dog handle your company paid for cataract surgery a few months back. Thing is, we slipped in a nice little lens that live plays everything you see, courtesy of our friends at DARPA. Then we may have had one of my guys tip off a bunch of Russian partisans about a truck carrying a VIP. It wasn't much of a surprise to me that the mercs found a dead kid in the suit a living 40-year-old battalion clerk. Well, lucky for you, the partisans may have been legally retarded. A wave of mixed emotions washed over me. Confusion, anger, frustration being a few. But I had one question for the old seal. Why me? Well, the seasoned killer took another chomp out of his cigar and pondered for a minute. I saw that Luca was still dumbfounded, not totally understanding the current situation. I put a reassuring hand on his shoulder letting him know that we were indeed safe, and just in case, I had the tocker off at the ready. Marsdale sighed loudly as he pulled the mag... Ugh. Marsdale sighed loudly as he pulled the masticated cigar out of his mouth. Total clarity? Oh, I wanted to recruit you. I read reports on you, met you a few times and decided that I'd like you on my team. I generally don't take folks who weren't in the military, but why are you one tough son of a bitch? I mean, you killed two armed men with a crowbar. Watching out the monitors, the whole team cheered. Some real impressive shit, son. But in all seriousness, Special Agent, you need to understand one thing. Our mission is more important than the people who've died here, and we'll stand by that fact. Well, I've heard it all before, in SAD, from SF guys, even from the regular soldiers I've met. But what makes this asshole's mission so important? Well, before I could ask, Luca spoke up. You guys fight shit like those monsters, don't you? Marsdale, seemingly taken aback by Luca's astute observation, turned to him and said, Damn, I thought you were a mute or a tar. But yeah, something like that. Nice guess, kid. Marsdale took another massive, sloppy bite from his cigar, sending bits of tobacco into his snow-white beard. But enough. I answered more than I had to. Now, 
get on the helicopter before the Rusky's device stops working and we all become dinner. I was more confused than at the start of the conversation, and angrier than I've been in a while. I took a deep breath and decided throwing a punch wasn't worth getting stuck on the island or my ass getting kicked by a guy who should have died in his sixties. Lucas shrugged his shoulders, still in shock, and we got on the chopper. As Marsdale took his seat next to me, I grabbed the tocker off by the barrel, reaching over to hand it to him. He put his hand up and said, ah, Keep it. It'll be a reminder of why you fight. You look like you need one. I nodded once, got into my seat, letting my eyes close as the helicopter took off. Well, so I've got this terrible feeling that a lot of you are going to be completely confused by tonight's story. But those of you who play PUBG, uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, you may have got a few in-references there and uh, totally enjoyed that one. <laughs> if not, then just enjoy it for what it is. And don't mind me. What the hell am I talking about anyway? Forget it, forget it, forget it. He'll be back again on Friday with another story. And indeed I will be. But until then, my dear friends, I hope you enjoyed this long story for what it was, and if you uh, got the references, all good. Well, till Friday, sweet dreams, my dear friends, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>